much and um, I'm going to talk about Alps, <coughs> I'm going to talk about dry stone structures in the Alps in the high altitude. First of all, what are the Alps? Um, the Alps is probably one, is one of the most important quantum chains in Europe and they are characterized by their verticality in the sense that they go, the altitude goes from uh, zero meters above the sea level to uh, three, four, almost five out five thousand meters. So this verticality affected, influenced the way uh, human communities since prehistoric times interacted with the with the Alps. You can see an example of a uh, high altitude landscapes. Um, in this presentation, we'll focus on the high altitude landscapes. So let's say above sixteen, seventeen hundred meters of elevation. Uh, where seasonality is the main strategy carried out. Nowadays, and historically, one of the most important strategies carried out at high altitude in the Alps is transhumans. For those of you that are not familiar with uh, this concept, I would describe it really briefly, is the movement of animals from the lowlands or the plain to the, to the uplands during the summer in order to exploit the uh, high altitude pastures. Uh, uh, that are available uh, during uh, summertime. Transhumance has been a key in the economy of the Alpine communities for th uh, centuries and millennia, and nowadays is uh, also an important um, a cultural heritage, an uh, intangible heritage for Alpine communities and part of their identity. The origin of transhumance is uh, widely debated. We have archaeological finds, especially in the last 20 years, the archaeology of the high altitude expanded um, uh, significantly, and we have um, paleoecological data as well. But as I said before, we have contrasting um, uh, evidence of, about the origin of the strategy. For instance, in the Tunisia Alps, we have evidence of uh, human impact on the environment since the 5th millennium BC and in the Schneiderjoch uh, we have with um, uh, nice, really um, amazing uh, material culture for, like this um, wooden bowl uh, dated uh, 4500 uh, BC but at the same time in the Eastern Isles we have the Iceman I think everybody knows who it is and, uh, and the pollen record doesn't provide any evidence of human impact on the environment for the 4th millennium BC, so the period um, when the Iceman uh, was supposed to um, uh, hike up the high altitude of the Tyrol. So that, therefore it was uh, thought to be uh, a hunter-gatherer rather than um, a shepherd. In any case, we can say that pastoralism uh, spread in the Alps between, let's say, the 5th millennium and the 3rd millennium BC. The first sites occupied by uh, pastoralists in high, high, high altitudes are usually uh, rock shelters. So the earliest archaeological evidence of pastoralism at high altitudes uh, uh, comes, comes from uh, uh, rock shelters or from ephemeral open sites. But something happens around the mid third millennium BC. For instance, let's start from the French Alps. In the French Alps, we have clear evidence of partial occupation of the high altitude since the fourth millennium, at least. But only uh, from 2500 BC, um, approximately, uh, we have uh, the appearance of these dry stone structures. That occurred from the from the early from the late Neolithic, early Bronze Age, up to the modern uh, the modern period. In the Swiss Alps, again, we have evidence of human impact on on the environment on the high altitude environment since the Neolithic, but the the, um, the uh, Neolithic pastoralists uh, used to occupy rock shelters, and we have also isolated fireplaces found 
core in some areas, in, uh, in speci specifically in these areas, so this is very massive between Switzerland and Austria. While dry stone structures, um, the earliest dry stone structure date to the end of the Bronze Age, so the end of the second millennium BC, and the early Iron Age, so the early uh, first millennium BC. If we move to the Austrian Alps, here the archaeological investigation at high altitude is more scattered, so there are different small projects uh, all over the place, but we can say the same thing. Uh, the occurrence of uh, clear paleoecological and archaeological evidence of pastoralism at high altitude during the Neolithic and the Copper Age, let's say, the late Neolithic, while and Bronze Age, while uh, dry stone structures appear only in the Iron Age, in this case mainly in the late Iron Age. If we move down to the Italian Alps, though, we have a different pattern. This is a site quite interesting, dug in, uh, in an area not far from where the ice band was found, and this is the earliest dry stone structure uh, found in that area. We're, all, we're always uh, around uh, 2,000 meters of elevation. Although there was uh, uh, evidence of uh, a pastoral occupation since the Neolithic, well, the late Neolithic again, and the, the Bronze Age, the earliest dry stone structure dates to the Iron Age. For the pre-Alps, we are uh, in this area near the uh, Lake Garda, this is a very interesting site, Dosso Rotondo in Trentino, uh, we have an evidence of a transition from a uh, uh, timber structure, number one, to a dry stone structure, number four, in the same place. And this transition occurs slightly earlier. We are around uh, the end of the uh, uh, early Bronze Age and the beginning of the late Bronze Age. If we move east to the Slovenian Alps, the, as far as I know, the earliest record of dry stone structure at high altitudes uh, is uh, for the Roman age, although again there is a, a clear evidence of uh, human occupation and pastoral activities at these altitudes for uh, the uh, uh, prehistoric and protohistoric periods. If we put all this evidence on a, in a, on a map, we can clearly see that there is a sort of chronological evolution. So, mid Bronze Age in the Italian Alps early Iron Age in the inner Italian Alps and south of, like, let's say, um, uh, Swiss and Austrian Alps. Then in the Northern Alps we have late Iron Age and Roman period for the Slovenian Alps. The problem is that the uh, evidence we have so far is scattered. We have few case studies and, for instance, the account, so the case study that I mentioned for France is isolated. It's much earlier than, for instance, the Italian case study, and we have a massive gap for the Western Alps, so we don't know what's going on there. So, what were these structures for? Um, in order to understand how these structures were used and what were their function and how pastoral communities interacted with these structures, I carried out some ethnoarchaeological investigations in different parts of the Alps. In fact, there are still areas where um, pastoral communities use dry stone structures still nowadays and as you can see these are central and western Italian Alps these dry stone structures are used uh, to produce cheese and are used also as a dwelling by pastoral communities. At the same time we have some other areas where um, uh, enclosure, dry stone enclosure are used by herders in this case these enclosures are mainly used to milk the animals for cheese production uh, while this enclosure, as you can see, is just to uh, uh, bring, um, gather the animal uh, for staying overnight. So, once I marked all these structures and identified similar patterns of appearance, and uh, uh, I've identified, I realized that these structures, and we realized along with, the, with my colleagues, we realized that these structures don't appear with the first um, uh, colonization of the high altitude by, um, by pastoralists, we ask ourselves why do these structures appear in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and the Roman period? The first thing we can think about is 
and is a little bit environmentally deterministic is timber shortage. And I exclude that. Because although we have clear evidence of wood clearance for the high altitudes, dry stone structures also in the ethnographic uh, records, we know that dry stone structures have a lot of timber in the roof, they have their posts. On top of that, they needed timber for uh, as a fuel anyway, especially for producing cheese. And the third aspect is paleoecological data suggests that although clear, uh, wood, wood clearances occurred, these were not that uh, significant in the sense that a lot of, for instance, in France, the earliest uh, pastoral sites at high altitude uh, were uh, located within. Uh, uh, the woodlands, or at least at the interface between uh, the woodlands and the pastures. So it's not related to a timber shortage. We can interpret these later appearance of dry stone structure as a um, uh, um, correlation between uh, the uh, use of the high altitude and uh, a change in cultural attitude towards the high altitude. And this change in cultural attitude to it, the attitude might have been triggered by the explosion of metallurgy that occurs during the Copper Age and that changes the um, exploitation, the attitude uh, in, uh, and the perception of the high altitude by um, the Alpine communities. But at the same time, we have, for the same period, a little bit earlier, the expansion of new populations pastoral populations now with the new genetic um, investigation that we heard uh, about before. Uh, this is quite clear and this population might have triggered a new perception of mobility, of remoteness of the high altitude and the new importance and role of pastoralism. But at the same time, we have ethnographic um, anal analogies that suggest that the appearance of dry stone structures might be related to a change in the economy. Uh, during my ethno-archaeological uh, research, I realized that herders that deal with non-dairy animals are much more mobile than herders that deal with uh, dairy animals because they need to milk them, they need to store the milk, they need to process the milk, and they need to store the cheese. So they need a permanent structure. Therefore, the hypothesis was that um, um, regardless the significance of the cultural change that occurs during the third millennium, there was also a functional significance of these uh, structures. Uh, recently, we carried out, uh, along with some colleagues at the University of York, carried out the analysis of um, some potsherds from uh, prehistoric sites at high altitudes. And uh, the uh, purpose was to identify uh, the earliest evidence of high altitude daily production that is still one of the key of the economy of alpine communities. And we realized that, as you can see from these uh, plots, that the earliest evidence of dairy lipids in potsherds occurred um, in the, in the uh, Iron Age potsherds, while dairy lipids are not present in, are not yielded by um, uh, Neolithic and Bronze Age potsherds. Interestingly enough, all these potsherds come from dry stone structures, and actually the, dry, the earliest dry stone structures in this area of Switzerland appear between the late Bronze Age and the early Iron Age. The hypothesis then is that there, is, there actually is a relationship between the, um, the origin of upland dairy and the occurrence of dry stone structures. So, uh, in conclusion, I think that uh, this preliminary investigation of the dry stone su structures at high altitude in prehistoric times suggested that there is uh, an, like, an interplay between different factors. First of all, a cultural factor related maybe to the um, uh, arrival of new populations and uh, that triggers a new perception of the high altitude, of mobility, of seasonality, and a new perception of pastoralism and pastoral products. And at the same time, the starting of uh, a new production like uh, high altitude dairy 
uh, if you want we can discuss later. I am aware of the fact that deering is documented in the early Neolithic, but in the lowlands, while in the uplands, economically, socially, and from a product point of view, it's uh, completely uh, different. It has a completely different role. On another thing that is quite interesting is that the appearance of these um, dry stone structures at high altitude is not uh, um, uh, is chronologically uh, quite uh, diverse. So you have a process. So that goes from the uh, from the, the Bronze Age uh, towards uh, the Roman period, and this process is uh, occurs in space as well, not only in time. So. It's interesting because uh, we need further investigation to understand this process. On the other side though, as I said, these intriguing spatial temple pattern that we have identified is quite obscure. We need more investigation in this sense. And also, as I've already pointed out, most of the, um, the all the data we have uh, uh, are uh, unevenly distributed. So we have areas that were well investigated, were areas that are completely uninvestigated, like the Western Alps. So we need um, more data, we need more investigation as the high, high, uh, high altitudes. To conclude, I haven't talked about rock arts and I haven't talked about ritual sites like the Brandolfo Plexa that appear in this period in, um, in the, well, during Bronze Age and then the Iron Age at high altitude. The importance of rituality in the, this process of petrification of the high altitude landscapes is still to explore and in my view relevant. So, thank you very much and I'm ready for the questions.